everybody can, can see this, this first slide. Um, this, my, my name is Kimberly Schwabenbauer. I am a registered dietitian and I'm specifically, um, I specifically do counseling with athletes. So um, my, I'm a board certified uh, specialist in sports dietetics. So um, I'm a registered dietitian, but I've also passed an additional exam specifically for uh, counseling athletes and counseling team and other individuals. So um, I'm excited to share with you today. Hopefully all the, you are, aren't hearing all the dinging and all the kind of stuff when we admit people. Um, hopefully everybody will be here soon. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to share with you. I'm also a professor at Clarion University in nutrition. So I teach there in our nutrition and fitness program and I'm a doctoral student as well. Uh, and I own my business. So I've just got a couple things going on. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about myself in just a, a few minutes. So um, thank you for attending today. I'm really excited you're here and I promise you're gonna learn a lot and it's gonna be some fun too. So thanks for, for joining us. All right, make sure I can advance these slides. Nope, not working. Okay, hold on, this is gonna work. We're gonna figure it out. I love technology. I'm sure you guys feel the same. Okay, here we go. <laughs> How my athletic journey began. So I'm actually from here. I grew up in Knox, PA, went to Keystone High School, and I started running with my mom at a very young age, and I ran cross country and track. That's when we had these really amazing uniforms back in the day, so this is probably like, oh, this would be about 96, <laughs> and uh, that's over at the Clarion Track, so that was one of our district meets, and so I ran in, in high school, but I really wasn't necessarily good enough to be recruited by any teams uh, for college, but I did want to run. But I spent my first semester and well, actually first year not competing in athletics, but then I actually tried out for the cross country team at Penn State. And I walked on to the team mostly because we were so horrendous at the time that I was able to walk on there. there we really were not doing well. Um, I ended up training very hard and really working hard. And uh, my nickname was, was Rudy, uh, which is after the movie. Um, and you may not have seen that one, but it's a great movie if you ever get a chance to watch that one. And I became a, the captain of the team and a, a team scorer. And after, um, after I was at Penn State, uh, I actually um, started my own business and I ended up getting my master's degree uh, after getting my bachelor's in nutrition science. And then I'm hoping to become um, Dr. Kim Schwabenbauer uh, at the end of 2021. So stay tuned. This is this is part of my work as a as a doctoral student. I also in 2005 um, started triathlon, and then in 2010 I became a professional triathlete. So I've done 15 Ironmans, which is a 2.4 mile swim, 112 mile bike, and 26.2 mile marathon. So let me know if I should get you all signed up for that today, right? <laughs> Anybody excited about that? <laughs> um, yeah, no, I know. I see Brenna's eyes. She's like, uh, no. So yes, I, I've done lots of Ironmans. I've been second like four different times. I was, I lost my final, um, one of my final races, I lost by one minute and 28 seconds in a nine hour day. So that was a little salty, but um, it was an amazing race. And uh, I started my, my counseling business and endurance coaching business. And I've been doing that. Um, for, for quite some time. All right, so enough about me. This is my crazy life. I also have a titanium plate in my collarbone up there in the right-hand corner. I wrecked my bike and um, I almost quit the sport and that was all before I turned pro. So I'm glad I didn't because it ended up being a, a great career and a great, great um, just experience all around. So I'm thankful for that. Um, so why sports nutrition? So hopefully this will work to show you this video very, very quickly um, on my screen here. It's my daughter, Emma. All right, so hopefully this works. This is why sports nutrition. You know, over 700 athletes came here to run in 2008. That's a lot more than the year before as this classic race continues to draw athletes from around the world. They come to see if they can tackle the beast on the bike and if they can survive the heat on the run. For few, it's also a chance to qualify for the Ford Ironman World Championship. Number 580, that's Kimberly Schwanbauer. And she has a place in Hawaii within her grasp. She's leading her age group, but then the course starts to take its toll. Now on behalf of Greg McFadden, thanks to everyone here in St. Croix. Thank you for joining us, the 2008 edition 
on the St. Croix Ironman 70.3. And for Kimberly Schwanbauer, the journey is complete. Hawaii is next. Okay, so not how you want to finish a race, right? <laughs> um, not my ideal day to finish a race like that. And the reason that that occurred um, was because I didn't drink enough. That was a hydration related issue from a sports dietitian. So talk about me not practicing what I, I was preaching. I just didn't realize how hot it was going to be in St. Croix in May. I wasn't drinking enough to keep up with my sweat rate and my electrolyte balance was off and all kinds of crazy things started happening to my body. And don't worry, I learned a lot from that race, started really applying what I knew and I had a lot better career after that. But sometimes we have to really take things to heart about sports nutrition to have things go the right direction. So um, these are some of my later races. The left is in Melbourne, Australia and the right was um, one of my last races in, in Montremblant. So why are we really here? It's because you love pizza and I'm gonna tell you never eat it again. You're eating broccoli instead, right? I, that'd be a sad, sad day. I love pizza. So I would be so sad to have to say that to you. And trust me, I'm not saying that. Today is all about balance, moderation, and doing some amazing things for your body so that you can be a better athlete. So here's a little quiz for you. How much do you know? Let's find out right from the very beginning. So these are true or false questions. Sports nutrition helps you recover faster from workouts. Um, how about we go up is true and down is false. Ready? One, two, three. Oh, okay. I'm seeing some good stuff from people who have video on. True, the trues have it. I hope you, you got that one correct. Absolutely. It helps you recover faster from workouts. Athletes don't need carbohydrates like pasta and grains. They just slow you down. True or false? True, false, true, false. And whoops, whoa, don't look at those other ones. Got a little click happy there. Um, false, carbohydrates are the basis of our diet. If people tell you that carbs, quote unquote, quote, and I hate to even use this word, carbs make you fat, they are 100% wrong, especially for athletes. So do not buy into that. Beans are a good source of protein and fiber. Hopefully you didn't see it. True or false? Ready, set? Okay, good. Yes, they are. They're a fabulous food for us to add to our diet. A good rule of thumb for hydration is your pounds divided by two to equal the ounces you should drink per day. True or false? Everybody's been like nailing them so far. True. That's one to think about. You'll learn more about that later. Okay. So what are some of these benefits of sports nutrition? They let you train longer and harder. They, it delays the onset of fatigue so you don't feel as tired as fast. It enhances your performance and it promotes optimal recovery, which plenty of you just got that correct on the quiz. Improves body composition. Can it really do that? Yes, it absolutely can. Body composition is your, your amount of muscle, um, the ratio of muscle within fat to your body. So um, that's something that athletes care about and sports nutrition can help with that. Enhances concentration. That's one we're gonna talk about a little bit later for you breakfast skippers, because trust me, I was in high school once too, and in college, I, was try I tried to get up late and just whatever, I'll eat a bar on the way, or I just forgot altogether. What happens to your body when, that, when you do that? Maintains your immune function. If you are sick, you can't train. So, you know, if you're continually getting sick, not recovering well, your immune system is gonna take a hit. So sports nutrition can really help with that. Reduces the potential for injury. Did you know that if you are dehydrated, you are more likely to pull a muscle? So hydration can truly matter. If you pull a muscle, all of a sudden you're sitting on the bench. Reduces the risk of heat cramps and stomach aches? Huh, that's an interesting one. I don't know if that's one you've thought of or not, but um, anytime that I talk to an athlete about if they're having trouble with their digestive system and they just don't feel well or their stomach feels all gross or things like that, sometimes it's actually a sports nutrition issue that they are either over drinking, not drinking the right things, um, drinking too much, uh, drinking too little, and it's usually when it's really hot. So that's when those kind of things happen. So what does your everyday diet look like? We used to have this thing called the food pyramid. You guys might, might remember it from when you were little. 
we've now gone to my plate and we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute but in general the biggest source of your diet you can see on these percentages carbohydrates but not just any carbohydrates we're going to talk about high quality carbohydrates what does that mean so we'll talk about that um, a portion of your diet should absolutely is from lean proteins so that's really really critical and especially at certain times the timing is really crucial for athletes on this one and then calories from unsaturated fats so that's going to be critical as well and so fat is still good fat is important for us um, it's just we don't want to have the wrong types of fat and too much of it. Those are kind of what we're trying to avoid. Oops, I have to do it this way. All right. So other things we want to talk about, the high quality carbohydrates. What does that mean? You'll see whole, the word whole grain is on this particular side twice. How do we know if something is whole grain? It is not just because the bread is brown, people. It is, you actually have to turn over the bread look at the first ingredient led on the ingredient ledger if it says whole wheat or whole grain you know it's actually whole grain if it just says you know uh it's the most amazing 12 grain ezekiel whatever whatever might not be whole grain so you really really want it to be whole grain um that's one thing we want to look for in our in our high quality carbohydrates whole wheat pasta awesome source of high quality carbohydrates brown rice is amazing um, quinoa is amazing. Some of those ancient grains like amaranth and, um, and buckwheat and spelt, those are ones that we hear a lot about, but quinoa is getting more mainstream and you can actually find it in the frozen section. You just literally pop it in the microwave in the bag and you can make it. So you don't have to be an expert to make quinoa anymore. Um, fruits and vegetables. That's one that, that a lot of times athletes don't think about is fruits and vegetables. And, and those are really key because they provide a lot of micronutrients or vitamins to our diet. And athletes do need vitamins and minerals in order to recover properly. And fiber too. That keeps your digestive system healthy. Um, how about those unsaturated fats? What am I talking about? Well, we're basically talking about vegetable oils, um, things like especially olive oil, canola oil, things like that, nuts, um, things like uh, low-fat dairy. And, and why do we need these? Because they provide these fat-soluble vitamins. You have to get these vitamins from your diet. So A, D, E, and K um, come from your diet. Now, you may have heard of the sunshine vitamin. Like, we all need to go out and get tan, right? Get out there. Get your tan on. Well, <laughs> what we're talking about with vitamin D is that you actually have it in your skin already, the non-active form, and the sun does not like bestow upon you vitamin D. Instead, it actually activates the vitamin D that's already in your body to the active form. You only need about 15 minutes though of exposed time um, to ultraviolet rays. And tanning beds don't have the ultraviolet rays that you need in order to convert to vitamin D. So don't let them use that as a marketing technique to get you in the tanning bed, because that's not true. So um, we really need those fatty fish. That's a big one. How many of you guys are fish eaters? I hope you're all like, yeah, maybe. Tuna, salmon, things like that. So, so, so good for you. They actually help reduce inflammation. So let's say after a really hard workout, your muscles are really, really inflamed, and this is your this is your your artery or vein. It really closes down when things are inflamed. So you can you can't get as much blood through there. Now you eat some unsaturated omega three fatty acids like good sources of, of of fatty fish, walnuts, things like that. It opens up your blood vessels and allows more blood to go through and helps clear out those. Um, things like lactic acid and those other waste products of working really hard in the gym um, and on the court. So keep that in mind. So we, we do need this. These are really important. Fats are not a bad thing. Um, we just want to try to avoid the saturated fats and the things like a ton of fried foods, um, things of that nature. So not to say you ever can't have the bloomin' onion. You can, but just moderation, people. Okay, lean proteins. So what is a lean protein? Um, everything like grilled chicken breast, tuna, turkey, um, lean cuts of beef. And beef is a lot leaner than it used to be. Beef really got a bad rap, and now it's much, much leaner than it used to be. Um, we aren't seeing the same thing where eating more beef equaled uh, heart disease. You know, it's not like we're, we're telling people who um, do have heart problems to completely avoid beef anymore. We're telling them to eat it in moderation in the right amount, like three to four to five ounces of beef is the appropriate amount not the 12 ounce ribeye that you get in a lot of uh, restaurants. 
lean ground turkey, um, eggs or egg whites. Eggs are an amazing source of protein. One egg, seven grams. And I'm going to teach you today how to calculate how many grams of protein you need per day so that you can figure out specifically um, what you should be shooting for, especially if you guys track on those, uh, some of those apps that we, we use sometimes, like MyFitnessPal or things like that. And it doesn't have to be animal-based products for protein. Um, beans, tofu, hummus, edamame, those are all vegetable sources of protein. However, let me say this while I'm on the soapbox. We do have certain amino acids that are in protein. I'm sure you guys have heard in your science class, amino acids are the building blocks of protein. So there's certain ones you have to get from your diet. You can't make them yourself. The essential amino acids um, are in higher proportions in animal-based protein. So if you've been trying to figure out what protein powder to get, a pea protein is not going to have the same amount of essential amino acids as say whey protein. So if you make your protein smoothie, make it with whey protein, okay? W-H-E-Y, whey. Whey is the way to go. That's how you remember that, okay. A um, little cheesy, but who cares? Okay, so how many, how many grams of protein do you need per day? It is more than you think. So for, you can fit, write this number down, 0.6 to 0.7 grams of protein per pound body weight. So if you know your pounds of body weight, you can figure this out. Just to give you a quick reference, if you're 145 pounds at a very minimum, this is probably a minimum of 101 grams of protein per day. And that is not just going to happen. It is going, you're going to have to focus on it. And one of the hardest things I see with athletes is that they just go, I'll, I'll get out of bed and I'll just have like a piece of toast and then I'll just, or I'll have like a bowl of cereal and I'll, I'll go out, and, you know, have my day. You need to be focused on eggs, things like Greek yogurt in the morning, about 20 grams of protein is what you should be shooting for in the morning. And so if you make little egg muffins the night before, you know, in the, in the little muffin tins, have two or three of those, you know, in the morning. Um, with some fruit. That would be an amazing breakfast. So sometimes it takes some planning to get your protein at breakfast. So making sure you get the amount of protein you need and space it throughout the day. So you might do 20, 25 grams at breakfast, 25 at lunch, 25 at dinner, and a couple of snacks to at 10 to 15 grams, and then you've got it licked. So start looking at the amount of protein in some of the, the things that you eat. So this is another um, slide that kind of tells you the same thing, um, body weight, this does grams per body weight and per pound body weight, and then also gives you kilograms, which are, um, you don't need to worry about. So just an idea for starters um, is 150 pound athlete, 102 to 136. So again, it's gonna take some concentration because you guys are growing. So you're, you're growing plus your athletes, um, plus you just wanna be strong. So we just need to really focus on protein too. So what does the athlete's plate look like? It looks like some fruits and veggies, um, some grains and some lean protein. So making sure you have all those things on the plate and still notice that grains are a big portion of this. So um, we don't wanna be skimping on grains. We really wanna make sure that, that you include those as your best possible source of fuel. Some basic keys, there's no one magic food. I am not against any food. I like ice cream, I like all of it. Um, I just make sure that as uh, an athlete myself, that I just make sure I focus on the 80-20 rule, 80% 80 of the good things um, and getting it right and 20% of not worrying too much about it and wholesomeness. So if we can choose things that are sort of lightly processed, um, then that's really the way to go. So how about breakfast? That's the toughie. I was already on the soapbox about, about that. Um, you've got to have it, you, especially as athletes and as students. If you don't eat breakfast in the morning, your brain is not going to function because your brain only runs on glucose, which is the most simplest form of carbohydrate. No glucose in the morning, you're, you feel like foggy, you feel like lightheaded, you cannot think for your classes, for your exams, you're not gonna do as well. So um, you wanna avoid that feeling. So if you can get a, br a breakfast that has both fiber and protein, you're going to make better choices all day long with your nutrition. So you will make a better lunch choice, you go, um, you'll not be starving. You won't raid somebody else's locker for all their M&Ms, you know, stuff like that. We're going to try to avoid those kind of things. So we really want you to feel good all day long. That starts with breakfast. So you're, you're going to have to plan a little bit and make it fun. Like get on Pinterest and get a new recipe for some of these, you know, like ball, all these balls that people are making. Like they're just making these really fun, um, 
you know, whey protein balls and the egg muffins like I was talking about, those are awesome things to include for the morning. So here's your scenario. Woke up late, lunch is packed. All I have is a sandwich. Hmm, should I eat it? What do you guys think? Yes, no? Yeah, eat the sandwich if this is all you have. Then try to get lunch somewhere else. I don't know, ask your friend or like, or you know, go to the cafeteria. <laughs> um, I don't know what they have these days for you guys, but um, how about another one? Grab my friend's breakfast, looks tasty. Which one should I have? <laughs> Which one has more fiber and more protein, do you guys think? You think it's the wrap with peanut butter, bananas, blueberries, and granola? Yes, it is. So the peanut butter is gonna give you some protein. It's probably not as, as much as an egg, but it will still give you some. So go for the, the thing that has lots more nutrients, more protein, more fiber. The donut is, is fun. Have a donut every once in a while, but it's not gonna really have any staying power. So. You have to eat breakfast. You really need to, to have you know, your calories and your protein spread throughout the day. So three meals, two snacks, got a plan. And sometimes frozen fruits and vegetables are really good and they can come in handy. I used to keep a tuna packet in my purse and people thought I was crazy. But for me, it was just a source of protein that I could always have with me. And then if I could order a salad somewhere, I could always put the tuna packet on top. So things like that, you know, they're shelf stable. They work great. So, so things like that can really be amazing. Um, you know, things like no salt added vegetables, beans, all that kind of stuff, have those staples on hand. Make your plan on the weekend and then execute it on the, the weekday. Your post-workout meal and snack. So what do we wanna do? This first point, bullet point has this word in it, glycogen. Have you heard it before? I don't know, anybody? Yes, no, yes, okay, not sure. Um, well, glycogen is the storage form of carbohydrate. It's what powers you through the workout. And so if after you're done with your workout, your stores of glycogen are less than they were at the beginning. So you start here, you end down here. So what we really need is, is to bring those stores back up to where they were so that when you start the workout the next day, you feel amazing. So how do we do that? We have a, a post-workout, meal or snack that has both carbs and protein. Um, and the amount you're shooting for with protein should be about 20 grams. Um, and so that can be things like regular food. It doesn't have to be some fancy, fancy shake that you got from someone or something like that. It could be yogurt and fruit, bagel with peanut butter, an energy bar, just make sure that it has enough protein in it and that it has some carbs too. And, and we really wanna try to have something within 30 minutes if we can, or a full meal within 60 to 90 minutes. So if you're not gonna get that snack in within 30, make sure at least you have the meal bet between 60 and 90 minutes to really make sure you replenish those glycogen stores. Um, all right, so my husband is mowing. I can do this. Okay, um, so hopefully you can't hear that. So the night before, you wanna have something that has some carbohydrates in it as well. So that's really important and a little bit of protein. So what do you guys like to eat the night before? Do you ever eat something like stir fry with chicken? The whole thing is don't eat something random that you've never eaten before. Um, not that night before and not the day of that you actually are going to uh, have, have you know, the competition. You don't want to just try something out on a whim. Stick with easy to digest stuff that you've had before. Pasta with lean ground meat sauce is awesome. So what these, both these meals have in common is they have some carbs. The rice for the one meal and the, the um, pasta for the other meal. So we need that. It should be eaten a solid meal about three to four hours prior. So let's say that you, um, what would be time you guys would normally compete? Like that you'd have um, a match, like four o'clock? Is that right? Yes, no? Yes, maybe? No, okay. Hold up with your fingers, Brianna. I can see Brianna. Hold up with your fingers. Six, really? Seven p.m. Wow, okay, all right, totally was off there. Well then let's figure this out then. Um, what about, your, your lunch becomes extremely important and then having either your dinner early, like five, four or five, or just a very light, light meal-ish snack at like four or five so that you don't, you're not feeling too overly full whenever you actually hit the court. So mainly carbohydrate, lower in fat. So don't have fettuccine Alfredo at you know 6 p.m. You're gonna wanna roll out onto the court and then you're just gonna like lay over and go to sleep. Not what we want. So instead we wanna go with um, things that are easy to digest. Do not have uh, your gas formers, like this is not time to go get like 
bean burrito or spicy foods or things like that. Um, stuff that you've tried before. So you also wanna make sure you hydrate. This is in your regular life and especially on game days. So our goals are 12 to 20 ounces, two to three hours prior to exercise. Um, having a little sip of water, you know, every 15, 20 minutes. So somewhere in six to 12 ounce range, you know, you don't want to gulp, 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 because it'll really sit in your stomach and you'll feel it. Um, and then, you know, depending on where you are with the scale, sometimes females are like, I don't want to ever get on a scale. Other times people are like, oh, it's no big deal. So depending on what your viewpoint is of the scale, if you want to check to see on a really hot day, get on the scale before you go work out naked, write down your body weight, you know, X, 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 point X. So 135 pounds, point six, go work out, still consume fluid, but keep track of how much. Then come back afterward, weigh again, naked. You will find out whether you're doing a good job at actually keeping up with your hydration or not. If you lose more than a pound or two, then you're not in a good place. You're not keeping up with your hydration during the actual practice or competition. So um, anything over 60 minutes is when you use Gatorade. So if we're talking, you know, or if it's just ridiculous hot, like right now, let's say you just, you guys are working out outside and it is 90 degrees, I would not be opposed to Gatorade in this kind of situation because it has electrolytes in it. It has some carbohydrates, which are actually kind of keep you on point, keep you thinking well. So um, I'm not against it if it's really hot or if the workout is going to be longer. Um, you want to have a hydration plan and stick to it. So take that body weight, divide it by two, and that gives you approximately how many ounces you're shooting for as a minimum per day. If you're a big heavy sweater, you might need more. So keep that in mind. What's in sweat? Well, the things in red are the electrolytes and those are in the most highest proportion. So calcium, magnesium, potassium, composition of sweat, NACL, we're going to like science class here. So what should be in your actual um, replenishment kind of either drink after you work out or a Gatorade type thing, sodium. You do need sodium to be in there. It's an important compound. So if you are gonna use one of those types of drinks, it should have sodium, it should have potassium in it. So make sure that it does. And this is just a reminder slide saying, if it's under an hour, water. If it's an hour over, sports drink. Or if you're doing multiple, like a match, like a, like a when you have you know three, four different ones per day, like let's say tournament, could not think of that word, Tour tournament. So you guys are playing a tournament. You're like, I've got a 10 o'clock, a two, a four. That might be a day to use Gatorade as well because you're really trying to keep your carbohydrate intake up and you're trying to make sure that you're hydrated for the match. So, um, and having some little snacks in there that are easy to digest. So how much did you learn? Let's complete this cause and effect chart. So cause, skipping breakfast because you are so tired from studying late. So you either A, uh, feel great and ace your exam. B, crush your morning uh, PE class and practice after school. Uh, C, if you feel shaky and light, lightheaded and you can't think well. Um, or D, you must sit down at practice, you feel so foggy and just don't have enough energy. What do you guys think? Did we learn anything? I hope you said, feel shaky and lightheaded, can't think well and sit down at practice because you feel foggy and you don't have enough energy. So don't do it. Um, get your breakfast in. So I want to do something pretty quickly and I want you to have a chance to ask questions too. I'm not sure if we have time to, to watch this video today, but I wanna tell you about it for a minute and maybe you can check it out after uh, this presentation is over. I was the fastest girl in America until I joined Nike. Now this is not a slam on Nike. Um, what my research for uh, my dissertation is going to be is on something called the female athlete triad. And it's, it's about females who aren't consuming enough calories to support what they're doing. And um, this particular girl, Mary Kane, had an experience like that where her coaches just tried to keep convincing her that she needed to lose weight and lose more weight and lose more weight so she could be faster and faster. They're in her mind, that they're saying she'd be faster. What ended up happening was that she um, stopped menstruating, so she did not have a period anymore for years. And then her bone mineral density took such a hit and decreased so much that she had stress fracture after stress fracture after stress fracture. And this happened to many of the athletes that I actually was with in college because we didn't know enough about this yet to know what was going on. So I, I want you all to be aware that this exists 
And I want you to make sure that this is part of the reason why you're consuming enough calories to be an athlete. Because if you're not, you actually can be doing detrimental things to your body for the rest of your life. So that's the scary part. So, um, oh, it's gonna try to play. And I really want you to see it, but I don't think we have time to do it today if, if we will do questions. So um, I wanna talk about this for just a second and then we'll make sure we get your questions in. So what is the female athlete triad? It was originally described in 1997, which is the year I graduated from high school. So it's actually pretty new in the world of science. And it was first recognized as three separate things. So originally we thought it was just if you had an eating disorder or disordered eating. So we thought only people that have those things are affected that we thought that you lost, maybe lost your menstruation. So you had amenorrhea, that means losing your menstrual cycle. And then eventually you would end up with osteoporosis. But what we realized later is that it's actually a spectrum. You know, we can start in a good place and have some things traveling down to a not so good place. And then we can end up with um, things towards that, that red triangle. And that's not what we want. So we, we've actually had the most um, recent consensus statement talk about it in 2014. Um, and so what it is, let me just go back one second, is we start out at the green with optimal energy. We've got uh, regular menstrual cycles and we've got great bone health. Then we start decreasing the energy and I'll talk about why that might happen. Um, we start getting things happening in our body with our hormones, but we don't even know yet because we haven't lost our period at that point. And, but our bone marrow density is already going down and we don't even know it. And eventually we end up with um, long periods of low energy or not enough food to support activity. And then long periods of time without the menstrual cycle. And actually my friend Beth um, had uh, osteoporosis, osteopenia and then eventually osteoporosis at the age of 20. So it's, it's really, really young to be having signs and symptoms like that and it can happen. So why would we ever decrease energy? Why, what does this mean, this energy availability I keep talking about? What's the amount of energy remaining for bodily functions after exercise training? So, so it's basically dietary energy intake, what you take in minus how much goes out for your exercise energy expenditure. And when we don't have enough energy or food or calories, then we basically start to suppress things like reproductive function and growth and um, even our ability to regulate our own temperature. So why would we something like that happen? It could be because someone is dieting. So they said, I want to um, decrease my body weight. And so I'm going to go on this 1200 calorie diet. And I'm also going to keep exercising at this high level. And that goes on for a, quite a period of time. It could be unintentional, like in the summer when it gets really hot and you're just like, I don't feel like eating. You know, I'm, I just worked out for a long time, but I, I just not hungry. So it could be that you just don't realize how much you need. It could be that someone has an eating disorder or disordered eating. So they are intentionally restricting their food, cutting out whole food groups. Um, they're really making sure they eat very, very few calories. They're sort of an obsession with food, those kinds of things. So those are some reasons why this may happen. Then we start to get where someone has menstrual dysfunction. So they start to have um, abnormal eating behaviors. And oh boy, the slide is just going on its own. Um, let me do this. Let me, I wonder if I can hit pause. Um, let's just do it like this. So we start out with low energy, then the hypothalamus, which is a thing in your brain that helps control your hormones, disrupts pulses that start happening and they control your hormones and your appetite and your metabolism. So those kind of things start going to the wrong place. The pituitary gland stops um, having regular luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. And then it tells the ovaries don't produce as much, much estrogen. And therefore you, you start having non-ovulatory cycles. So you wouldn't ovulate. At the same time, you may start to have ogliomenorrhea where you start getting a menstrual cycle that can last longer than 35 days or fewer than nine menstrual cycles per year. You know, we wanna have one, one approximately every 28, you know, about 12 per year. So it starts lasting longer. Eventually it may turn into um, secondary amenorrhea, which is after you've already had a menstrual cycle and then it actually stops. Or it could be a primary situation where somebody never starts menstruating after, even after the age of 16. And what we know is that bone mineral density, whoops, is impacted. So um, this is when you're getting the most bone mineral density of your whole life. We want you to have great bone mineral density. So 
um, we actually start to see decreased estrogen and then estrogen, low estrogen means you can't deposit bone as well. So you get overall bone weakness. So who's at risk? You guys, <laughs> because you're an athlete. So, um, you know, athletes feel like they should look good, like they should fit in. Um, and females specifically are, are people that feel like they should look good or fit in. So um, we have more pressure on us. Instagram, it's brought out so much more in terms of pressure to have abs and do all these things. So, you know, we feel it. And a lot of athletes feel that, um, that they need to control their eating and, and decrease their calories, um, whether it's correct or not. And most of the time it's not. So there's a lot of health consequences, like a negative impact on current and future bone health, like stress fractures, nutrient deficiencies, fatigue, decreased training response, increased recovery time, and decreased performance. So the opposite of what we're going for with sports nutrition. So what do we do? We increase our calories, which is sometimes tough to convince women to do and athletes to do. Um, and so what we really want is you just to add a little bit more back in and have a positive body image. So you reach and maintain a healthy weight and body composition and, and you work on things that are maybe telling you in your mind that you shouldn't be, um, you know, that you should be decreasing your calories and you should look a certain way. So going against those kind of things. So what you guys can do right now, monitor and track your menstrual cycle, keep a diary or at least track it on your phone or something. Evaluate, do you eat three meals or more a day? Do you snack regularly? And, and you can record a day on, on one of those tracking apps. And how do you feel about your self-image? Do you need some help thinking positively about that area? Um, if so, talk to your coach, talk to your mom or dad, um, talk to someone you trust in your life. You can also eat a nutrient-rich, well-balanced diet, including, including enough calcium and vitamin D, so your dairy products. Exercise in moderate amounts, get plenty of rest, find ways to reduce stress, and talk to a parent coach, doctor, or counselor. And make sure you have a good team behind you. And I, your parents are on that team. So are your coaches, your physician, someone like me, registered dietitian, athletic trainer, physical therapist, and maybe someone for mental health as well. So what have we learned? What are the three components of the female athlete triad? It starts with energy availability and then possible um, problems with uh, menstruation or abnormal um, hormonal functioning, and then eventually possibly osteopenia, osteoporosis. Um, which athletes might be at higher risk? Really any female exercising or athlete. So, um, and especially those that are under additional pressure. And that's really all of us. <laughs> what is a possible treatment? Increase your calories. That's the first thing that we, we really need to do and talk to someone about this. And there's some, some great resources for you as well. So how about um, if we have time, let's do some questions and see um, what you guys have to say. So let's see if I can bring up um, where we are with this and try to answer some of those. So um, it's not that, let's see. I have a question. Oh, okay, good. I just saw, heard somebody come through, come on through. <laughs> hey, Corinne. So, <laughs> I'm just wondering, I'm not personally a big coffee drinker, mm -hmm. but I'm just wor wondering how like coffee could affect your game and like, like, what it is, does it have a huge impact on how you play? I will tell you this, especially for endurance athletes, caffeine has shown that it, and actually, um, people sometimes say, whether you're an endurance athlete or not, they feel sort of more on point when they have some caffeine. Do you feel like that's the case for you personally? Well, um, lately, I've been drinking these V8 caffeine. It has like a little bit of caffeine in it. Okay. And I feel a little bit like more active and not as slow I, I don't know if that's what I would consider it but I don't like heavy drink coffee so I okay. really don't know okay well let me say this um the typical cup of coffee has about 100 milligrams of caffeine in it that's an eight ounce coffee this is not you go and get the Starbucks you know venti or whatever the biggest one is so <laughs> um and the amount of caffeine for athletes that has been shown to be effective is somewhere in the range of 50 milligrams to um, it can be up to about 150 milligrams. So as a, for an average size um, female, I would say. So that being the case, you know, you may, this is not the time to go out and get, you know, five rock stars and just start, you know, going as hard as you can. I mean, you, what you find is you end up at 500 milligrams of caffeine and you're, you're just, you're shaking. You can't even do any, anything. That's too much caffeine, not what we want to do. Um, in small <laughs> amounts, it can, be, it can be somewhat helpful. And when I say small amounts, 25 milligrams to at the very, very top end, it would be like 150. However, 
you get more used to caffeine as time goes on. So your brain and nervous system gets used to seeing it over and over again. So if you have coffee every day, and then you sort of think, oh, I'm gonna have it on my day of, um, you know, of this tournament or whatever, and I'll feel like spot on, you, you're already used to it. So you don't really see as much of a benefit as if you're a, basically a not in general caffeine drinker, and then you just include a, a reasonable amount then you may you know, feel a little bit that way. So um, especially for teenage athletes, I'm in the, in the camp of very moderate um, amounts. So I think that's, that amount, it can be, you can feel like, okay,